Our guest in this segment is Nurse Angie Gray. Yo, Ange, how are you? Hey, Rob, how are you? I'm splendid. Wonderful, it sounds like it. So, uh, the other day, I get a text that, uh, you know, Rob, you need to get in touch with Angie Gray. She was on uh, PBS the other day, as she's become like the lead uh, contact for rural health in, uh, in this region and such. What's going on there? Well, for the first time, um, rural health is drastically doing worse than urban in our inner cities. So Janet Tobias, who's an award-winning um, director, I had done some work with her in the past. We've known each other for a little over three years, reached out to me and said that she was doing working on this piece for PBS News Hour and um, about Rural Health America. There's uh, five states they're going to, West Virginia being one of them, upstate New York, um, Colorado, Alabama, and uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to start with West Virginia. Um, there'll be six segments running um, every Wednesday at six. Pending the news feed, you know, things can bump that, uh, of course, what's happening in the country. Um, and they started with West Virginia last Wednesday, and then they'll do the other states. We'll air, and then we'll end with West Virginia on the sixth one, and it'll show our residents um, with Harper's Ferry, Family Medicine, and the School of Osteopathy. And what sort of things are you covering? Um, they just wanted to uh, really draw awareness, I think, um, to how um, the disparity um, is in rural areas. Uh, for health and how our our health outcomes I mean the, the the statistics are staggering you know when you're looking at half as many doctors in rural America um, almost 40 percent uh, less nurses in rural America our chronic disease rates are so high um, we're dying very young um, younger than what we need to um, and access to our health care I mean it's it's really showing and ha and like a 30% more on, on uh, suicide rates, um, significantly higher in depression, and then, you know, a year and a half waiting list to get in to even, uh, you know, psychologists for counseling. So, Did these numbers, you say that for the first time rural health care is, uh, people are in rural areas are getting uh, less effective health care than people in the cities. Was Is this a post-COVID thing, a post-opioid epidemic thing, or, or was, is there another drawing line? I think, there? there's, I think it's very complex. I think it's a lot of issues. Um, we were seeing this prior to COVID, actually. Um, I think COVID has drawn a lot of attention to it because we fared way worse with COVID um, than inner city did as well. Mm -hmm. um, that evidence is overwhelming. Um, so I think it's just, you know, the, all the data is coming in and, uh, you know, trying to bring awareness to this happening. Um, you know, our, our just our geographic to begin with of, of travel that we have to to get the places not having, uh, you know, as many health care um, providers in rural America, uh, you're on long waiting list. Um, so I think all of those things are, you know, contribute uh, as well as our culture does. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we don't typically seek preventative care. And it seems like our bar is set to treatment and cure of diseases, which is, of course are very, very important. But why isn't our bar set to prevention? Um, because many of these can be prevented or at least delayed until much later in life so that your quality of life is, is so much better and you're more productive, especially in your years of employment. You know, we have so many people um, you know, we have to go on disability very early in life, um, and, and it takes them out of our workforce because, you know, blue-collar workers come with a lot of injury. So, As we just heard from Mr. Gilstrap, falling yeah, through roofs. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. It wears and tears on your body, mm -hmm. so your body ages, you know, much younger. Bill? Yeah. Uh, good morning, Angie. Good morning. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there's shortage of doctors and nurses. I assume that was relative to the urban side. But there's a shortage of doctors and nurses across the board. Are we just received uh, the problem is more paramount or more intense in the rural than the urban side? That's Correct. Right. About 50 percent less doctors in the yeah. in the rural yeah. versus the urban and about 35, a little over 35 percent less nurses. Yeah, I'm I'm not too surprised with that. What I was surprised though, you said we have more suicide in the rural than the urban. Why is that? Yeah, a good question. Yeah, I think everyone's trying to figure that out. One, if you're having a crisis or you're having a mental health issue, um, you know, you heard if you watch the PBS special, 
you know, um, psychologist Samantha Diener in, in, here in our Eastern Panhandle said, you know, a year and a half waiting list for adults. And they got that down from two years recently and over a year for children. So we can't get them connected when they're in that crisis and get that support early on. And she even said, you know, when they call in crisis, we tell them to go to the emergency room because that's the only option that we have. If you have an emergency room, because several of the hospitals are closing now, especially in the uh, more rural areas, and I assume in our state, but I would imagine it's true in the other states as well. Yeah, absolutely. So your smaller um, hospitals are, I mean, they can't really function, um, you know, financially, right? Um, when there's a smaller amount of population that's uh, that they're seeing. And that's one thing I have to, you know, really give kudos to WVU Medicine. Um, they are going. They are buying some of these smaller hospitals in rural areas so that they can keep them open, even though you know they will not be profitable for decades, right? Yeah. But important to keep healthcare um, in our rural areas to our uh, to our residents. Now, uh, the PBS series that you referred to, uh, the problem is being highlighted. Are they going to also prevent, uh, present a solution? Yeah, I think the last segment is where they give us hope. Um, is the plan because we always want to give some kind of solutions and um, where to go with that and and I really think that you know a focus on prevention in this country is is huge I mean um, you know that is based upon population when I talk about fewer or less nurses less doctors providers um, access to health care our, our rates I mean it's not just because you know there's more people in cities I mean it's based upon the population so it's it's already adjusted for that um, so why are we, um, you know, is the big question. You mentioned the uh, term prevention a couple of so times, mm -hmm. but yet that's such a broad spectrum. We have obesity, mm -hmm. we have uh, diabetes, we have uh, mental health, we have the drug problems. You can go down, it's a very large spectrum of things that we need to provide prevention for. Uh, how do we do this? There's certainly not the resources. Yeah, um, and I think that is part of changing our culture of you know trying to get to more preventative services and really taking um, having the awareness for our own health. Um, you know, Dr. Laudner, who I uh, work very closely with at uh, Berkeley Medical Center, and he often says, you know, the best things in life for your health are free. Um, you know. Uh, the proper amount of light, uh, you know, with protection now with the sun, uh, sleep, um, you know, water, and exercise. I mean, we can do all those things for nothing. You don't, I mean, I'm not, you, I'm not a gym person. I'd rather walk, get out in nature. And we have so much of that around us that it would be very easy to access. And I think we've just <clears throat> become a culture of, you know, not investing in our own selves and the worthy of our health and what that looks like, especially at a very young age. You know, I didn't have a, a, a physician. I didn't grow up with having a pediatrician or any of those things. We didn't go to the doctor unless you really had a problem. So, you know, I had ear infections over and over. I never saw a doctor until the morning I woke up and blood was on my pillow and my eardrum ruptured. Um, I was, you know, probably in my 30s before I even realized that we need to have those things. So trying to break that generation of aspects and my um you know we raised our daughter that she had a pediatrician a dermatologist an eye doctor you know uh, every uh, an orthodontist you know everything she could and she is very much more healthier than i if was at her age and there you go and if you can afford it and that is a big thing because co-pays are real you know insurance doesn't always cover everything um so there is still a cost <laughs> This seems like such a cultural thing, you know. The the cliched country folk mm -hmm. aren't interested in in doctors. I'm not all that interested in in doctors. To be honest with you, I grew up much as you did. We, we never ever went to the no. doctor. If if it, it was you know if it's not broken, Don't it, it. it doesn't need it doesn't need medical care. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about bringing more physicians and more nurses, uh, particularly into real rural area areas, you know we're in the Eastern Panhandle, which mm -hmm. I guess is rural light, but you go into the southern counties of West Virginia and what have you. Can a doctor make a living down oh, there? And that's a good point, yeah. I mean, that is a big draw, right? Um, you know, you have to pay back for all your medical uh, or your, all of your education expenses for medical school. And, um, you know, mostly when doctors come out, we think, oh, they're rich, you know, but they're not. You know, yeah. they have a whole lot of, of uh you know, school debt and all those things that they have to 
um, pay back, and they also, you know, have to make a living in well, with their family. And I also grew up, showing my age here, I also grew up in the era of the house call. Yes. When we did see a doctor, the yes. doctor came to the house and did what he was going to do. I, I didn't start going to doctor's offices until probably as a teenager. Mm-hmm. So what are – changing culture, I think, is – you can bring more services. That's easy – well, easy, right? Yeah. But to actually change the culture, I think, is – really difficult it's very difficult so how do you do that and not I, you but right us as a you know as a state as a you know as a region um i think you hit two very important things when you said um earlier about you know this is the eastern panhandle so we're late um and all of that filming was done in the eastern panhandle so i think that says a lot because it still showed we had a lot of this in this area we have the lack of the resources as well um and there's po- a lot of poverty here as well, even though we're seen as, you know, the more um, richer resource part of the state. So if you imagine if they were filming in southern West Virginia, you know, what else they would have saw. Let me build so. up on that just very quickly. Uh, John, excuse me for interrupting. Sure. No. Uh, the, uh, uh, between the eastern panhandle and the, uh, and the more southern part of West Virginia, there would be difference in scale. I suspect. Are there other unique differences, though? Are there certain difference, uh, certain uh, problems in the southern part of the state that we do not have here? I think our statistics are running the board the same with heart disease and diabetes and um, all of those chronic dis- illnesses that can be prevented. Um, I think we still are seeing that. And John, like you said, how do we do it? Like how culturally do we change? It takes a long time to change culture um, and to promote you know, prevention. But if we don't start, mm-hmm. we're, it's only gonna get worse. You know? you know, it just seems to me that not being a physician, okay, um, for the blue collar workers in particular, the ones that are always out, they're always swinging hammers, or that's, that is exercise. It is and right, it's, and oh. it's not always safe exercise, but right. but it, but it's exercise. Do we find a less of the heart disease and diabetes among that population than we do among the people who sit for a living? I do not have those statistics, but I don't believe so um, from what I have read. Um, and they are moving, but you have to think it has to be on your exercise has to be on what you do on a daily basis in addition to what you do on a daily basis and a routine basis. And those type of workers are exercising, but they're, you know, repeatedly doing things to their joints and those kind of things that was going to cause, um, you know, illness later on or chronic pain, which arthritis, yeah, arthritis, Mm -hmm. which back to, you know, the opioid epidemic, you know, that was a huge thing in our state with all the autoimmune disorders that we have, all the chronic disease that we have, all the blue collar workers that we have, um, who all come with pain. So it was very easily um, to see how the state um, was ravished um, during, you know, the opioid epidemic, um, because there was a lot of people who had a lot of pain. I want to carry us back to prevention uh, again, just quickly. Uh, and this is political, and I realize it will be political. But wasn't the Obamacare designed specifically to address the, the one of the prevention issues? Of yeah, and of course, I don't want to speak with anything yeah. of political, but I will speak about the Medicaid expansion. Yeah. Um, I can tell you, um, being a nurse through all of that, and what we see now, is we can get people to treatment more now than we ever could because of the Medicaid expansion. If we wouldn't have had that, we would be turning hundreds and thousands of people away because there would be no, no help, no linkage to care. And especially for, you know, our opioid epidemic um, prior to the Medicaid expansion, there was nowhere to send anybody for treatment or to get them help. Angie Gray is our guest substance abuse case coordinator our manager at uh, WVU Medicine. Uh, speaking of substance abuse, Angie, you've mentioned the opioid crisis a couple of times. Uh, is it still as bad as it was five years ago? I think that for the Eastern Panhandle, we have a lot more resources now and connections, uh, thanks to multi-community partners, our, our um, even our commissions and city councils and everybody working together to support this. So we're finally at a place that we can link people. But um, that's what I do all day long um, with my coworkers. It is still not easy to get help. 
you know, that there might be three, four weeks out before we can connect them. And that's why we have programs that we've initiated um, through our emergency room um, with our providers, like the bridge program. So if somebody has an appointment to get on um, Suboxone, um, you know, medically assisted treatment, um, three or four weeks out, you know, you're going to lose them in the meantime while you're waiting. So we'll bring them in through the ED, they'll get assessed, um, they'll get their prescription, and we'll make sure that we verify their appointments and get them connected um, to try to get them to help. And right now we're in a crunch that a lot of our providers um, who do that, they're maxed. There's, they're, they, they've sent me an email saying, we can't take any more for now. We'll let you know when we can. A few years ago, the news was filled on a regular basis with the names of people in our community who were dying of overdoses. Are there fewer people in that situation now, or are we just reviving them more easily with the uh, Narcan and such that's available? Yeah, I, in the last year, West Virginia has lost 1,500 um, West Virginians to opioid overdose. Um, we're seeing where the rest of the nation is is taking an uptick. We're for the we're seeing a decrease. Now we don't know yet. It's too early to tell if we're going to continue on that trend, which we're hoping we are, with all of that we have put into place. Um, but it's just too early to tell if that trend's going to continue. Um, but that is our hopes. On the opioids, a friend of mine just. Uh, had knee surgery, knee replacement surgery. Mm -hmm. And she laments the fact that with all of the, the rehabilitation and, and such, she's trying to get off of the painkillers, but it just hurts too much and, and she can't. So at what point does the transition happen and how does someone who is on opioids for the real reasons, how do they know that they've crossed over into addiction as right. opposed to using it clinically? Yeah, and you just said a great, really, interesting thing where you said for the real reason and i think that's what we forget is that you know most of the people in our state are suffering addiction were put onto them for the real reason mm -hmm. um even when i talk to somebody in their 30s now they'll say i always asked a person when was your first time you ever used they were kids um and they were like yeah i had a tip foot fracture when i was 16 or i had this or if they are older now they were middle-aged and had chronic illness and was put on um, and which is another big point is that we have a really hard time connecting someone who has Medicare if they're you know 65 or older because we have an aging population in this now and it's not so easy to get people to accept Medicare for for recovery treatment so I mean it is a big challenge to do that um, did I answer your question Sometimes well, I'm just I go curious around for, it. <laughs> I know that she is concerned about becoming addicted to oh these. yes thank you for bringing me back to that you can you can become addicted within three to five days of using opioids it can happen that quickly we are all different we are all wired different we know we have evidence this is one of the things we found in the last five years that some people have a direct link from their um, pain receptor to their frontal lobe which is where you make all your decisions um, and that's when medically assisted treatment really comes in and is very important with the opioid epidemic because it can block that um, oh. Yes, um, but we still need to get to the root causes, you know, because now we don't talk about alcohol enough in the state. We have the highest number of overdose deaths to alcohol as well. And from my office being right outside the emergency room now at Berkeley Medical, I can tell you we see just as many people with alcohol addiction than, as we do with opioid addiction. Um, to, to John's point, though, if, if you're on opioids, how do you know that you've become addicted? So you build a tolerance first. Um, most people, you get a tolerance, and then it, you, as you t get, take them for a period of time, then your body, it's a chemical f a reaction in your body. It's a physical, actual physical thing. And then if they're not going to work as well, and you're going to have to take more for them to be able to work and get the therapeutic that you had out of them. Um, and then before you know it, if you're doing that, then it just keeps building that tolerance to where your pain medications are not uh, going to be effective. You can take so many of them that you're never going to get that many prescribed to you. Um, and it's really different for everyone. That's why addiction and treating addiction is very difficult um, because you really have to look at the individual and the whole of their life to help with that. Um, but I would just say don't take them unless you really, you know, that's another epidemic we're having in this country. How do we treat pain? Because mm -hmm. we can't leave people in pain, right? Um, in excruciating pain. And I think we need to, that's an, another cultural thing we need to change is that our job isn't to get you to no pain. 
if you have a broken arm or you've had surgery, you're going to have pain. And we should be, you know, teaching you and educating you that you're going to have pain. But we want to get you to where that pain is manageable, that you are functioning in that pain. Because if we take you all the way to no pain, you're not functioning. You know, hospice recently started a palliative care oh, yes. treatment. That's I think is going to be a major, major benefit to the community. So. Yes, I agree. Hospice does really good work. Yeah. They also do grief counseling they and do. have a specific yeah. support group for those who have lost um, their children, yeah. their parents, their grandparents to the opioid epidemic. Because you know, it's it's a very different group of people than losing somebody to cancer. So the first episode of a six series. Uh, uh, production uh, was featured West Virginia. Now, the last episode, you'll also be back on PBS? It'll, I won't, um, but it'll be West Virginia. Yes. West Virginia. It'll be Harper's Ferry, Harper's Ferry Family Medicine with um, what they do with residents um, for new docs, you know, um, in training, and West Virginia School of Osteopathy Medicine with their residents. So West Virginia is going to be uh, featured twice. Yes. Uh, any particular reason? Was it just the locality? Um, they, we were actually only supposed to be featured once. Um, and then um, they told me that they got so much great footage um, that they extended to the six series versus the five, yes. Very nice. Yeah, but John, I'd like to really say that we have to start somewhere changing our culture when you said, and our children are very much key, is you know fostering a, gener a next generation that are invested in their health um, and that are educated and understand why it is important. And it sounds like there was some wisdom in my dad's attitude of, ah, suck it up. You know, <laughs> <laughs> put a Band-Aid on it and go back and play, right? So. <laughs> hey, uh, Ange, great to see you again. You too. Thank you, Rob. And you're over at WV Medicine now, again, as the Substance uh, Abuse Coordinator? Abuse Coordinator, yes. Very nice. Uh, bigger you. thrill being on PBS or on this show? <laughs> be it's careful how you answer to, that, Angie. It's always good to be in your hometown. Yeah. I'll take that as we're first. All right. <laughs> hey, uh, in all seriousness, great to see you again. Good to see you, too. Thank you. Uh, the much-accomplished and greatly accredited Angie Gray on the program at 832.